Welcome to St Mary's Church in Chalcombe. My name's Andrew Avramenko and I'm the curate and priest here. Part of a church benefice with St Stephen's in Lansdowne and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to our short informal online worship together for this week, the fourth Sunday of Epiphany. It's not just the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, it's the day when we remember Christ being brought into the temple by Mary and Joseph, where he meets Simeon and Anna. And we're going to hear about that shortly and reflect upon it together. But before we do, before we begin our worship together, let's pray and prepare with a prayer written for this day. So let's pray. Almighty and ever-living God, clothed in majesty, whose beloved Son was this day presented in the temple, in the substance of our flesh, grant that we may be presented to you with pure and clean hearts by your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Malachi, and it is a prophecy written, well, I'll tell you when, a bit later. But I wonder if you can work out who the prophecy is referring to. It's chapter 3 of Malachi. Uh, Malachi uh, verses 1 to 5. There's a link to the readings in the description below. It says, See, I'm sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and in former years. Then I will draw you near for judgment. I will be swift to bear witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired workers in their wages, the widow and the orphan against whom those thrust aside, the alien and those who do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. That person they were referring to at the beginning of that reading, see I'm sending my messenger to prepare the way, is of course John the Baptist. But before John came into the scene, we get to meet Jesus in our next reading, a time when, again, Malachi gives a hint of it. And our Gospel reading is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. After eight days, eight days had passed since he was born, it was time to circumcise the child. And he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. They offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested upon him. 
It has been revealed to him that by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple and when the parents took it, brought the child Jesus to praise him for what is customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to a sign and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and the sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer, day and night. At that moment she came and began to praise God, and to speak about the child to whom all who were looking for the redemption of it, Jerusalem. When they had finished everything, required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favour of God was upon him. Amen. So that marks the end of Jesus' time down in Bethlehem. Having come, his parents come from Nazareth, they head back. But we know it wasn't quite as straightforward as that, and he had to escape as a refugee to Egypt to hide from Herod. But that's for another time. We're going to reflect on those passages together now. But before we do, let's pray another prayer written for today. So let's pray. God of Anna and Simeon, whose law makes known the gift of life, whose love exposes the hardness of heart by your spirit, may we receive your faithful word to Gentile and to Jew, and know your reconciling presence offered for the world through Jesus Christ, the light and glory of God. Amen. As the youngest of three, I watched both my brothers reach the magical age of 17. They picked up their provisional licence and learned to drive the cars. It wasn't the prospect the freedom that driving can bring that I couldn't wait to experience. I had that with bikes, buses and trains. No, it was the skills and sensations of driving that I couldn't wait to experience. No doubt thanks to being a fan of motorsport for as long as I could remember. Those years of waiting were frustrating. Whilst I saw things happening for my brothers, nothing seemed to have happened to bring me to that magic moment other than the slow passing of days, weeks, months and years. Nothing seemed to happen, except, of course, something did happen. In the waiting, though, I was steeped in the experience of my brothers. My senses were turned into what they were learning and experiencing. I learnt as they learnt. Their experiences became my experiences. Though both were different, I was not simply waiting. I was progressing and growing and developing without even realising it until I found myself living and appreciating the experience I'd been waiting for. 
The wait seemed interminable until it was over. The wait seemed a waste until I discovered it wasn't. There was a lot of waiting for something to happen in both our readings today. One marks the beginning of a long wait, the other marks the end. But both waits were steeped in a prayerful connection with God, who moves amongst those who are waiting, guiding them, teaching them and preparing them. No doubt there were times when they could see where God was taking them. The prophecy in Malachi was certainly clear about the destination. But it was not clear when the messenger would suddenly appear, just as when I suddenly get my provisional driving licence. It was not clear about the wait, and oh, how they waited. You see, the book of Malachi is thought to have been written some, well, over 450 years before Simeon and Anna held the baby Jesus in their arms, and even longer before John the Baptist told who the baby they had held would become and his ministry. In the times when Simeon and Anna and many before them waited for the prophecy in Malachi to come true, to prepare for the Messiah's ministry to begin, there would undoubtedly have been times when they couldn't see when or how the prophecies, dreams and visions would be realised. In the times when the dreams and visions beyond Malachi's of the ministry of the minister and the Messiah Jesus was still being made, was still waiting to be realised, they undoubtedly would have been frustrated, impatient, even despairing. But in those times of waiting, they, when they couldn't see the path to the prophecy when they couldn't see what they were learning or what God was preparing them for, well, their determination and perseverance that was founded on the hope, trust and belief in God, well, that carried them through. That hope, trust and belief came from and was fed by prayer, worship and fellowship. And though they could not always see it, in that prayer, worship and fellowship, God was preparing and transforming them. The ground, not just them though, the ground on which they walked and the people that they met would meet. And this is where I believe we are today, particularly here in our benefice. As a church and a fellowships, and perhaps even as individuals, we are in the waiting. Yes, we are waiting for God's kingdom to come, for Jesus to return a second time and make all things new. But that's a universal waiting. Such a wait is for an undetermined time, a wait for something written with de and declared with no indication of when it will happen or as it will. We wait with all of creation for that to come to fulfilment, to be realised, but we here at St Mary's and St Stephen's have a different waiting as well. The time of waiting that we are in is in the waiting of Simeon and Anna. Theirs wasn't a waiting for something to happen after their time. Theirs was waiting for something to happen in their time. For something to be realised in the years of their lives that they could foresee. And we are waiting for things to happen in the future time that we can foresee too. We are waiting for pews to be full to bursting of new and seasoned believers in the one who will come to fully realise and renew God's kingdom. We're waiting for the ancient stones of this church of St Mary to call the living stones of the present to worship with them. We're waiting for the beacon that is St Stephen's to illuminate the city of Bath's hearts, defeating the darkness and revealing a hope 
but unifies believers and not yet believers alike. We have been waiting for such things well before the current cost of living crisis and the coronavirus pandemic. That's so fresh in our memory. But both have focused our attention on the hope, indeed the need, not only for people to return to church, but for people to come for the first time. That hope, that need and that call is for people to explore and embrace the warmth of fellowship with God through our churches and through the communities we leave our churches and go into. Our churches connect as if in solidarity with the challenges people are facing, with pain for what's needed. Uncomfortable as it is to say, this very church's ministry depends on us all enabling it with our own finances. Finances which we know are being stretched by rising prices and diminishing incomes. Both depend on us taking God's love out of them into our homes, schools and workplaces, to our family, friends and acquaintances, and to our communities of those we know and those we don't. And both need to be like Simeon and Anna and soak our lives in stone and, and soak our lives and these living these stones both the physical stones of geology, hard rock, and the living stones of flesh and bone, in prayer for God's love to catch, carry and care for people's hearts, minds and spirits. Simeon and Anna's encounter with the baby Jesus teaches us many things, not least being that age is no barrier to encountering God. Whether young, not so young, or somewhere in between, we all have an integral place in God's plan for us as individuals, a fellowship, and a community. Both Anna and Simeon were thought to be in the twilight of their earthly lives when they held Jesus in the temple when he was barely eight days old. That they persevered and kept hope alive through the many years of waiting for the prophecies. Dreams and visions to be realised is testament to the power of prayer and fellowship that kept them connected to God and each other. The fuel that kept them going, when the we whether the waiting was easy or hard, had, was a spoken and unspoken conversations with the divine in the temple and beyond. We see that made explicit in verses 26, 27 of the Gospel passage, where we're told that not only did the Holy Spirit prompt Simeon to be in the temple, but gave him the confidence to know that he would see the vision realised when he was there before he died. Simeon and Anna saw God's salvation appear in their arms, not because they happened to live at the right moment in history, although that undoubtedly helped. They saw it because of their love of God and their understanding that God was at work in that place. God is at work in this place, in St Mary's, in St Stephen's and in your lives too. It's a love that draws us together, to draws us into this place. A love that draws out hope in the waiting. When Simeon and Anna met Jesus in the temple, they saw their dreams realised, but the end of that wait marked the beginning of another. For in holding Christ, they not only knew the peace of God's presence, but knew he would be bringing that peace, hope and love to others to the whole world, to the Jews and the Gentiles, the rest of the world. They knew that though one wait had ended and another had begun, the one that had ended, and like the one that had ended, sorry, this one would involve them too. We've seen the return to some normality of life since the pandemic 
but the wait for the full realisation of God's love, hope and peace on our lives, community and church has only just begun. As it was for Anna and Simeon, we, will, we are called to be active in our waiting. Like Anna and Simeon, we'll be fuelled by a persistent prayerful connection with God as we gather together, as we leave our churches and our places of work, worship and home into taking in to take his love into the community. So I'm going to set you a challenge to find new ways or revive old ways of speaking and listening to God in your daily lives and in your waiting. That might mean a conscious conversation with God as you walk to school, work or some other group. It might mean a conversation with God fueled by embracing a different type of tradition or prayer, praying with others in church, in a home group and beyond, praying with the Church of England daily prayer podcasts or praying with smartphone apps like Pray As You Go and Lectio 365. And I hope in taking on that challenge, it will draw you further into this place to get to know God greater and deeper, his love for you and his love for others. And if you're wondering how, then wonder no more because we are going to be beginning Lent shortly with a week of 24 hour, seven days a week prayer at St. Stephen's. For that place to be the beacon of and beaten heart of Lansdale. So check it out on our website or come, even better come to St Stephen's or here to St Mary's and find out more. Amen. Well having talked about prayerfully waiting we're going to we've come now to a time of prayer so let's pray these prayers for epiphany and the response for which is kiri eleison so in faith let us pray to god the father his son jesus christ and the holy spirit for the church of god throughout the world let us invoke the Spirit. Kiri Eleison. For the leaders of nations, that they may establish and defend justice and peace in Ukraine, Syria and Yemen, in Latin America, Africa, Asia and beyond. Let us pray for the wisdom of God. For those who suffer oppression or violence. Let us invoke the power of the Deliverer. Kiri Eleison. That the churches may discover again their visible unity in the one baptism which incorporates them in Christ. Let us pray for the love of Christ. Kiri Eleison. That the churches may attain communion in the Eucharist round one table. Let us pray for the strength of Christ. Kiri Eleison. That the church may recognise each other's ministries in the service of their one Lord. Let us pray for the peace of Christ. Kiri Eleison. For those sick in mind, body or spirit, that they may know peace, recovery and good health, let us pray for the healing of Christ. Kiri Eleison. That those who mourn may know joy and gladness in place of grief, let us pray for the comfort of Christ. Kiri Eleison. In a moment of silence, 
Let's hold all these people and all those people and places dear to us in prayer before God. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let us collect our prayers together with the prayer that Jesus taught us, in whatever language or version which is true and dear to us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, our time together is drawing to a close. I hope that you will have a blessed and refreshing and rewarding week ahead of you. But that even if you don't, even if you find yourself facing challenges and difficulties during the week of sorrows, that you may know the love and peace and even joy of the Lord in moments, if not in the entire week. And may Christ, whose glory fills the sky, fill you with radiance and scatter darkness from your path. May Christ, the Son of Righteousness, gladden your eyes and warm your heart. May Christ, the Dayspring, from on high, draw near to guide your feet into the way of peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Goodbye. God bless you. Take care.